Welcome back. Attorney Andrew Bethel of Bethel Law, where we talk, you know what, let's skip through all the intro. We got a lot to talk about today. We're talking inherited IRAs and everything you need to know about inheriting, well, an IRA. We've discussed the investing numbers you need to know when funding your own IRA, so you'll see a link in the corner for that video. However, you won't need to know any of those numbers for today's video as we're going to be focusing primarily on, like I said, inheriting an IRA. On a quick note, even though I'm not banking on this channel and my own retirement plan, a like and subscription from you would be greatly appreciated. So without any further introduction, let's dive in. Firstly, just so we're on the same page, let's briefly go over the IRA basics. IRA stands for Individual Retirement Account. It's a retirement account created by the Employment Retirement Income Security Act of 1974, commonly called ERISA. While the yearly funding limitations for IRAs are lower than that of a 401k, you aren't beholden to your employer to create or fund your IRA. Additionally, there are a lot of different IRAs with their own rules, but the most common are traditional and Roth IRAs. Both carry their own tax perks depending on when you want to ultimately pay the taxes. With a traditional IRA, you often get tax deductions when you put money in, but you pay taxes when you pull money out during retirement. On the other hand, Roth IRAs use money you've already paid taxes on, but the magic happens when you withdraw during retirement. It comes out tax-free. Now what happens when someone inherits one of these accounts, and what are the rules? Let's talk named beneficiaries first. If you're named directly as the beneficiary of an IRA, you're what's called a designated beneficiary. If you're the spouse of a decedent, well, here's at least some silver lining to an unfortunate situation. You get more flexibility on that inherited IRA than non-spouses. And much of this is due to a big rule change that occurred in 2019, the SECURE Act. The 2019 SECURE Act made many changes when it comes to retirement accounts, but relevant to today's discussion are the changes made to inherited IRAs. The main headline is that most non-spouse beneficiaries of an IRA have a 10-year window to withdraw all the assets held in said inherited IRA. There are no specific rules as to the rate at which you need to make the withdrawal, only that the IRA must be emptied by the close of year 10. Of course, what would a legal discussion about rules and regulations be without some exceptions? Certain beneficiaries like minor children of the decedent or those with chronic illnesses get special treatment, and which can be distributions calculated based on their life expectancy rather than 10 years. For minor children, this means they must be, well, a child of the decedent, notably not a grandchild, and they must be under age 18. However, that 10-year rule kicks in once they reach age 18, essentially meaning they'll have until 28 to pull all the money out. Again, we have those who are chronically ill or permanently disabled who can qualify for an exemption from the 10-year rule. And interestingly, if a beneficiary is not more than 10 years younger than the original IRA owner, let's say they were only two years younger, then they can also be exempted from the 10-year rule. Now let's shift gears a bit and discuss what if an IRA is left to a trust. Trust can be conduits where the money flows straight through to the beneficiaries or accumulation trust where the money, well, accumulates. In conduit trusts, all required minimum distributions, RMDs, from the inherited IRA are required to be passed on to the trust beneficiaries, essentially as if they had been chosen specifically to begin with. The flexibility for the decedent when doing their initial planning is the ability to amend their distribution at the trust level, but not have to turn around and involve the company administering the IRA itself. Under the SECURE Act, those beneficiaries of the trust can likely elect what to do with their own share of the IRA. That is, take a little bit out over time, pull it all out at once, or leave it in there to grow for 10 years. Yes, they would be subject to the 10-year period depending on the beneficiary's status as we've already discussed. Under an accumulation trust, RMDs are allowed to accumulate inside the trust, which can then be distributed to the trust beneficiaries according to the trust terms. Essentially, the trust is going to hang on to those distributions from the IRA and thereafter subject them to whatever conditions the trust store put in place when creating the trust initially. To know whether your trust has the required conduit versus accumulation language, you're gonna to have to review the terms of the trust to verify the correct elements are present, which I'll list for you right now. First, the trust is valid under state law or would be valid once the trust is funded with IRA money. Second, the trust is irrevocable or will become irrevocable by its terms upon the death of the IRA holder. This is typically the case when you set up a living trust that is revocable during your lifetime, but where it becomes irrevocable after your death. 
Third, the beneficiaries of the trust are identifiable, as in we can figure out who is to be the beneficiary. And fourth, a copy of the trust must be provided to the IRA custodian by October 31st of the year following the death of the IRA holder. Frankly, it may be easier to simply speak with your attorney. Additionally, if you have a financial advisor, then it's a good idea to introduce them to your estate planning attorney so they can coordinate whether there is any specific language their company might want to see in these types of trusts as well. On a quick detour, let's briefly discuss taxes. Trust taxes is a complicated subject we've talked around on this channel. Don't worry, that video and a deep dive on trust taxes is coming, but for today's subject, we're gonna keep complex trust taxes pretty simple. Trusts reach the highest tax bracket at a much lower income level than individuals. If the trust retains the distribution, as in an accumulation trust, the trust pays the tax at its rate. It makes distributions to the beneficiaries a little cleaner and that they receive their money and that's it. Unless there is a state that collects an individual inheritance tax. If the trust distributes the income to beneficiaries, as in a conduit trust, the beneficiaries report the income on their personal tax returns and are liable for the tax. The reason you would do this is because the individual is going to pay a much lower tax rate than the trust, meaning the check they wrote to Uncle Sam is gonna be a little smaller than if the trust wrote the check on their behalf. Procedurally, the trust will file a tax return but issue a Schedule K-1 to each beneficiary noting their share of the taxes. That beneficiary then files the K-1 with their personal tax return. Before we go, I wanna run down a couple smaller points related to inherited IRAs that you should know. First is that these rules, specifically the 10-year rule, also applies to 401ks as well. The SECURE Act didn't only target IRAs, but retirement accounts more broadly, and there are some subtle differences depending on the type of plan in question. We can do a video on that if you'd like, so let us know in the comments below. Next, you should be aware of the penalties for failing to adhere to the 10-year rule. 50% of the amount that was not taken out within the deadline, which is of course steep to say the least. So be careful when reaching the 10-year deadline. Don't let the money sit in there too long and give the government extra taxes and penalties for no reason. Which on that note, when you begin taking that money out of the inherited IRA, you're gonna be paying some income taxes on each of those distributions, whether it be small ones over time or a large one all at once. The government wants their money. That's why they force you to take it out. Now related to that as well, you may be aware that there is a penalty for taking money out of your retirement account before you reach a certain age, which is currently 59 and a half. Now the SECURE Act did lower this penalty from 25% to just 10%, but in the context of an inherited IRA, this doesn't matter. Since withdrawals are required, you won't pay the 10% penalty if you're under age 59 and a half. Lastly, keep in mind that your state may have its own laws to consider. California generally follows federal rules for the tax treatment of IRA distributions. However, California does not have an inheritance or an estate tax, so beneficiaries won't face additional state-level inheritance taxes. Your state may have its own rules to consider, so speak to either a financial advisor, estate planner, or tax professional when you're inheriting an IRA. Remember, it's your future, your family, and your legacy. However, these are general guidelines and rules can change and videos can become out of date. So talk to a professional near you to make sure the rug doesn't get pulled out from under you. I'm attorney Andrew Bethel. With a topic as broad as this, there's a chance I missed a point or you're now thinking of a question that I didn't answer. Either way, drop a comment below. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you found this video helpful and check out our other great videos. Stay informed and I'll see you next time.